for that um, show for Glow, they told me that my character was going to be an ex showgirl, and uh, I said, "All right, well, I'll do it if I can get in a showgirl costume at some point." <laughs> I'm Prerna Gupta, a tech founder, and in this series, I'll explore how exceptional people succeed by following their hero's journey. Hi, Gina. Welcome to Hero's Journey, and thanks so much for joining. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. So one of the most important qualities of a hero is that they use their superpowers to empower others. You have exemplified this trait throughout your career in the strong female characters you've played, the ceilings you broke in the 90s when no one was even talking about gender equality in Hollywood, and the very important philanthropic work you've done with the Gina Davis Institute and the Bentonville Film Festival. Let's start with the characters you've portrayed. To name just a few, you've played an outlaw, a baseball player, the first female president of the United States, and most recently, a Vegas showgirl turned hotel manager. Watching you play these characters throughout my life has been such an inspiration to me. And what I've always wondered is, how did you do it? At a time when there were so few substantial roles in Hollywood for women, how did you land so many of them? <laughs> you know, did, did you seek them out or did they just kind of come to you? Well, yes, you know, I have to admit that I did manage to land some of the best parts <laughs> uh, that were around. So, uh, so I'm thrilled about that, obviously, and that also that I got to play so many different kinds of characters. I feel like I never was typecast. A lot of times I went after those, these roles uh, very intensely. Um, uh, the Accidental Tourist was, was one of them, and uh, uh, the one I uh, went after the most ferociously was Thunla and Louise. By the time I read it, it was already cast, and uh, I kept wow. Track of it. Yeah, I, I kept track of it. I kept track of it. If anything happens, you know, and da da da. And um, I had an agent who was very helpful and persistent, and would call Ridley Scott once a week, uh, just to say if anything, <laughs> if anything happens, you know, Gina's still interested. So finally, it took a year until I was able to uh, actually meet with Ridley Scott and convince him why it, I had to be in it. So, uh, but thankfully it, uh, it paid off. But I was like, I am going to be in this movie, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Well, what I love about that is it just shows that it was your strength and your confidence, you know, as, as a woman to go after those roles. And that's really, really amazing to see. And I will say that I do think it's more than luck. You know, the reason that you got those roles, it's because you really embody that woman, the, the woman who can be a role model, who is who is a rebel, you know, who is strong. It just comes through um, in your aura. And, it, you, and you were able to portray that, like you said, not just as a typecast character, but in so many different characters. And it's, it's incredible. It's really, really amazing. Thank you. So is there a particular role in your career that has had the most impact on you personally? Yeah, it was definitely Thelma and Louise. It's a fabulous part to play. It was an incredible experience getting to uh, spend every day with, with Susan Sarandon and, you know, learn so much from her. Uh, I would talk about women who move beautifully through the world and uh, are in charge of their own destiny. You know, she's, uh, she's a perfect example. But, um, but it was also the reaction that the movie got. Uh, none of us expected that it would explode like it did. I mean, we, it was a low budget and we hoped people would like it, but no idea that it was going to take off like that. And uh, what it showed me was uh, how few opportunities women get uh, through the movies to feel inspired and empowered by female characters. You know, almost every movie that comes out, male audiences are welcome to identify with, with someone in there and uh, um, live vicariously through them, but it's very rare, actually, for women to do that. And uh, it, was, it was really eye-opening to me the way you know, if somebody recognized me on the street or whatever, the, the way they would talk to me about it and about how much it meant to them and how it changed their lives. And I was like, me too. So ever since then, I decided to make my acting choices with 
the women in the audience in mind? What were they going to think about my character? And uh, would it have some kind of positive impact? And not, not that I wanted to play... Uh, you know, role models, because some of Louise are like horrible role models anyway, but, uh, but uh, you know, that I would want to lean more toward women who were in charge of their own fate or became in charge of their own fate, you know, that um, were responsible for their destiny. That's really, really amazing that you have that insight and that depth really at, at such a young age and such an early time in your career. And you had so much impact as a result of that. It's so cool. <laughs> so take us back to when you were a little girl. You were born in Massachusetts. Your mother was a teacher's assistant. Your father was an engineer. When did you know that you wanted to be an actress and how did you break into Hollywood? Well, evidently, I don't remember this, but evidently my parents said I announced to them at three that I was going to be uh, in movies. And I cannot tell you what I saw, where I got that idea from. Uh, but it never wavered. I was just sure, you know, because of course it always works out. You know, I was absolutely positive <laughs> that I was going to get to do this thing. And, um, and thank God it did work out because it's, it's my love. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's what, I, what I love doing. Um, and I'm so grateful that I, that I have got to do it. I studied acting in college and uh, I went to Boston University but they didn't give any advice on how to get a job, where you should go, how you should get a job. And pretty much all of my classmates were going to go to New York to try to get in plays. And I knew I didn't want to be in plays. I wanted to be in movies. But nobody said, you should go to L.A. instead. <laughs> and so I went to New York with everybody. And then I decided, you know, if I could become a famous model, they will just offer me movie roles because at that time, uh, Christy Brinkley was in some movies and, and uh, Lauren Hutton. And uh, I thought, sure, sure, I'll just become a model and then I'll naturally become an actress because it's so much easier to become a supermodel. Uh, <laughs> but I, I got an agent. Well, when you're Gina Davis, it's so much easier to become a supermodel. Well, well I never did, thankfully, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but I did work here and there and... Uh, uh, when they were casting the movie Tootsie, it was shooting in New York, and so they called model agencies to see if they had any models who could act, because the role involved being uh, the character being in her underwear quite a bit. And they thought, well, let's see if there's a model who happens to be able to act. So they called my agency and they said, yeah, we have one. And, uh, <laughs> and so I auditioned and got the part. So it was incredible. Amazing. It was incredible. Like, what are the odds that my first job is going to be doing scenes with Dustin Hoffman? I mean, you know, Amazing. beyond imagining. And, and yet there I was. Well, you were clearly more than worthy. And you have gone on to have a very illustrious career, as we talked about. And, you know, after role after role after role and so many accolades at a time when I think most people would just kind of sit back and sort of just, you know, count the money and <laughs> just, you know, just enjoy, you know, chill out, you know, um, and not really do anything. In 2004, you decided to launch the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. And you have done incredible work with this institute since then. What inspired you to start this organization? Well, it was very specific. It was my daughter. Uh, when she was two, I decided to start watching little kids' programs with her, you know, uh, preschool shows or G-rated videos or whatever, and sat down with her. And uh, the very first thing that I turned on, within a few minutes, I was thinking, wait a minute, how many female characters are there in this show? And uh, I started counting on my hands. And then I uh, had my computer next to me, so I looked up uh, what, the, uh, what the situation was. And, uh, and there was tons of male characters and one female character. And I thought, well, this is surely an aberration. And, uh, and I started noticing it more and more and more with things that I watched with her. There was a a movie that came out 
that had uh, that once the mother dies gruesomely in the first five minutes, uh, there's only one female creature in the, in the rest of the movie, and I couldn't believe it. And I, I didn't intend to, you know, make it my life's mission or anything, but it was so <laughs> stunning to me that we'd be making these kinds of things for kids and in the 21st century. So I asked a bunch of my friends. None of them had noticed. And then, uh, because I meet with people all the time in the industry, uh, I would invariably ask them, have you ever noticed how few female characters there are in movies and TV made for kids? And every single person not only said, that's not true anymore, but uh, but they, they insisted that it was uh, on the top of their minds. Um, th they, at their studio company or whatever, it's all we think about is doing right by girls, and we know we are. And and I think, yeah, but you just made that movie with one female character. How is this adding up? So that's when I decided that I wanted to get the data. That's, that's what really changed everything was um, seeing how nobody seemed conscious of this phenomenon. And, uh, and if I got the data, I could go back to these creators and say, I didn't think you were aware, but what do you think now? And so that's what we've done in the about 15 years that we've been uh, in existence is do massive research and then use it to go directly in a very supportive, private, collegial way to say, hey, were you aware of, of this? And, uh, and it turns out that it is the magic key, the, that the research <laughs> in this case is, uh, is absolutely the, the thing that changes people's minds. That's amazing. It's so smart. It's so smart that you, A, thought to start with children because that's, you know, that's the first touch point. And, and children are exposed at such a young age to media. And when they're two, if all the messages that they're getting is are that, you know, men and boys are in all the powerful positions and they're the heroes, then, you know, what hope do we have by the time that they're adults? That's so smart. Well, that's exactly right, is, is that I decided... We're teaching, we're teaching unconscious bias from minute one. We have to stop doing that because we all know how difficult it is to get rid of bias and unconscious bias later. You know, we all, all the, the world seems to want to improve, uh, you know, women's status and, uh, and, and equality, but it's very hard to correct once it's internalized. So let's not do it from the beginning. And uh, yes, that is the goal, exactly. I love that. And I love that you focused on research and data. I mean, I'm a tech person, so I'm a big believer in data, um, but that's just such a perfect use of it because it really helps, like you said, people thought they were, that they, they were doing a good job already. Mm -hmm. And you know, when they're faced with the stats, it, it helps them see that actually they're not. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, know, if, if you have them, just so we can get a sense, what were the stats on gender equality in media when you started? And how has that changed over the past 15 years since you've been doing this? And how has your, you know, I think in a large part, the work that you did, and you started this early when really no one was talking about it, has had, has had what seems like a big impact. So what were the stats then and what are they now? Uh, well, at the time we started, um, there were uh, three male speaking characters to every one female speaking character in both uh, kids TV and kids uh, movies. So up to PG-13, GPG and PG-13. And, uh, and there were very few uh, lead characters that were female in films. I think the first time we looked at that, 11% uh, of the lead characters were female. And um, so these were, you know, Pretty shocking numbers, and uh, and we started our work, and uh, uh, in you know, in maybe just a few years, we uh, were now at uh, two to one instead of three to one as far as the the general populace of the uh, of the um, a movie or show was concerned, and then uh, it, it kept creeping up, but also the thing that changed and has changed the most uh, in all of the different areas of improvement we're looking for is lead characters. Uh, because in uh, TV and movies, 
made for kids, aimed at kids, we are now uh, at 50-50 for the lead characters, which is a massive difference than when that we began. And what could be great. better? Amazing. What could be better than 50-50? So, uh, yeah. so we're thrilled about about that. And and so we're we're still um, obviously we want to make sure that that gets maintained. Um, and we're really also looking at what was very important to me is the world in which the fiction takes place. Uh, how balanced is that? And uh, and there we still have a lot of work to do. Um, not as much as we used to, but still more work. And also we look at not just uh, gender, but uh, uh, characters of color, uh, uh, characters that are otherly abled, um, age, we look at age, we look at body type. And uh, there's about six things that we uh, are working on and looking for to, to really balance out the worlds that are seeing. And it's not radical because we're trying to make them look like real life. <laughs> we're not trying to do something that doesn't already exist. We just want the worlds created in fiction to reflect the real world. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And very, very well said. So you have had this incredible impact over the past 15 years, changing the stats on gender equality and now just diversity and representation in media. And you have also over this time, you know, been doing an incredible job unearthing and championing beautiful films made by diverse filmmakers. Um, you recently wrapped the seventh annual Bentonville Film Festival, where you showcase many of these films. Tell us a bit about the festival and why it's so important to you. Yes, uh, yes, I'm amazed that it's already been seven years. Um, this, uh, this sort of sprang out of uh, some of the ideas that, that, uh, that I was already working on, we were already working on, um, as far as representation goes. And uh, it just seemed like a great idea to have a film festival that was solely dedicated to uh, uh, presenting, you know, underrepresented voices. And uh, so um, we look at not only to, to qualify to be in the film festival, we look at not only who's on screen, of course, but uh, who's the writer, director, producer, um, and, uh, and, and all of that. And, uh, uh, and this last year, I might not get the numbers exactly right, but uh, it was something like 77% of the films were directed by women and 72% uh, by people of color and uh, 67% were directed by uh, uh, people who were LGBTQ plus. And, uh, and so there's, you have to realize <laughs> there's a lot of intersectionality there because those numbers don't add up to 100. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of people who are, you know, hit, hit multiple categories. Those stats are staggering, especially when you compare them to the kind of status quo in Hollywood. So right. it's really amazing. And right. I'm very excited about uh, the films that, you know, that you featured and excited to watch them all. They're all in my queue. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to close by asking you about a nuanced issue when it comes to women's empowerment, and that is female sexuality. So historically, the notion of a strong woman and a sexy woman have really been at odds. You know, when I was graduating from college and interviewing for jobs on Wall Street and in consulting firms, the advice that I got repeatedly was to do everything I could to tamp down my sexuality, you know, wear a big boxy suit and, you know, try and speak in a lower voice and <laughs> all of these things. And it's something that really never sat right with me because that's not natural for right. me. And I also feel now as I'm getting older, I'm starting to feel that pressure again to tamp down sexuality. You know, I'm a mo mother now, I'm gonna be 40 soon. And it's like not okay for older women to be sexual. <laughs> and, you know, watching you, what I've loved about just your career is that you've always bucked that trend. Mm -hmm. You've always played very strong female characters who are also sexy. And most recently, um, you played uh, in the show Glow, a 
Vegas showgirl turned hotel manager. And there's this one scene where you get up on stage and you wear the most epic showgirl costume I have ever seen. It is just amazing. And you look spectacular. I mean, I was blown away. I love it so much. And I found myself empowered once again, watching you, you know, thinking that, wow, like I can be sexy too at 40, at 50, at 60. And I can also be a strong woman at the same time. So what I'm wondering is, you know, as, as, as an icon of women's empowerment, you know, and, and you're out there doing this philanthropic work, it's, because in most people's mind, women's empowerment and feminism are really kind of opposite to women's sexiness. You know, do you ever, do people ever give you flack for kind of combining these two things? And when you go out and you play these roles, you know, and you, and you, you know, show up on stage, you know, barely clothed, <laughs> you know, is that like, do people say, hey, wait a second, you're not supposed to be doing that, Gina, you're about women's empowerment. Right, right. Uh, you know, it's it's tough because, um, I mean, it's it's tough to compare it to real life because uh, my industry is all about being as sexy as possible. Um, and uh, uh, if you can manage to be sexy in your later years, I think that's, uh, that's uh, seen to be, uh, you know, okay. Although, uh, you know, as far as women, um, let's say over 40, uh, being the romantic lead in films, it's you know that that's uh, that's actually quite quite rare. For that um, show for Glow, they told me that my character was going to be an ex showgirl, and uh, I said, "All right, well, I'll do it if I can get in a showgirl costume at some point." <laughs> Because I don't know, I've always had this image of showgirls here with a giant headdress and everything. How cool that would be! And uh, so we went for it in a big way. <laughs> well, you nailed it, and it was awesome. <laughs> okay, so we are going to end with our rapid fire hero's journey questions. There are four questions, and uh, the first one is: What's your favorite book about a hero? It can be fiction or nonfiction. The book I've read the most that's about a, a powerful woman is, uh, is called Imperial Woman by Pearl S. Buck. It's an old book about the last empress of China. And she's not a great uh, role model, <laughs> exactly, but, uh, but she achieves and, and, and retains power. And I've, I've read it dozens of times. I just, I just find it so fascinating uh, and colorful. I'm going to add that to my list. All right. Question two, what's your superfood? Baked goods, pastry, uh, cake, cookies, pie, <laughs> anything that's been baked. All right. Question three, what's your kryptonite? Believe it or not, it's, it's uh, saying what I think uh, is my kryptonite. And uh, I, I've spent my entire life trying to close the gap between uh, when when something comes up and when I say what I think about it. Uh, because I, I was raised to be so insanely polite that uh, we could never challenge anybody and never question anything and, and just oh, laugh off, you know, whatever it is. But uh, it wasn't that long ago that I thought, ah, I've defeated my, my kryptonite. Uh, a, uh, a director on something I was working on said, oh, hey, good morning. And, you know, people will usually hug on sets. Gave me a big hug. And while we were still hugging, he said, my favorite part of the day when I get to feel up Gina Davis. And I know he was trying to make a joke, but I instantly said, Wow, that's not appropriate. And he was so shocked and like apologizing, falling all, all over himself to apologize. No, 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 this is what I meant. I was like, that's okay, because I was so excited that I said wow. what I would have said if I thought of it later. So oh, Gina. <laughs> I know, I know. It seems so small, but it's so significant. It is so significant. And I know, and all, all the women watching this know how significant that is. Right. The final question What's your secret weapon? Oh, oh, I keep it very secret. What is my secret weapon? I think maybe humor. 
maybe humor, my sense of humor. I can get away with a lot by making it funny. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I will also add your smile. You have the go. most beautiful smile oh. I've ever seen. So. Oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, I'll say that next time somebody asks me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Gina Davis, thank you so much for joining Hero's Journey. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you. You are such an inspiration to women all over the world, including myself. And it is such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you.